Hello and good afternoon, everyone. I am very pleased to welcome you to NACDL's overview of resources and strategies for juvenile resentencing cases presented in collaboration with the Campaign for the Fair Sentencing of Youth. I'm Vanessa Antone, NACDL's Resource Council, and I'm very happy to have here with us today Heather Renwick from the Campaign for the Fair Sentencing of Youth, where she is co-legal director, to present to you on these topics. Heather has extensive experience in this area. She joined the campaign in the summer of 2014 as litigation counsel, and in this role, she has been a resource for Miller litigation in Virginia and across the country. Before going to law, she did work in international human rights and social justice issues, including as a Fulbright scholar in Bulgaria and Washington, D.C., and in Nairobi, Kenya. After all of her work on issues such as pretrial detention and sexual violence against minors, in that capacity, she decided to attend law school and pursue her interest in social justice that way. She has experience in capital defense and representing youth who are charged with crimes and in trouble that way and in civil um, class action litigations. She's passionate about reforming the justice system and passionate about the defense of children. She's here today to help all of you with your work in this area. So I will now turn it over to Heather to get you started. Thanks, Vanessa. It's a pleasure to have an opportunity to talk um, with you all today about the resource kit we at the Campaign for the Fair Sentencing of Youth have created um, and talk about some post-Miller, post-Montgomery litigation strategies uh, to you know, get you thinking creatively about your representation on behalf of individuals who are sentenced as juveniles to life without parole. So as Vanessa said, I work at the Campaign for the Fair Sentencing of Youth. We're a national organiz organization uh, committed to ending life without parole for the children in our country, um, and instead to advocate for age-appropriate sentencing alternatives. Um, as co-legal director, I have the good fortune to work with many of you um, who work on defense teams across the country representing children um, and adults at resentencing. So for those of you listening to the webinar who I've met before, thanks so much for joining. Um, for those of you I haven't worked with yet, I look forward to engaging you in the future. So let's go ahead and jump in. So just an overview of what we're going to talk about today. I'm going to start with um, you know, sort of a summary, macro level picture of juvenile life without parole trends nationally um, to talk about legislative advances um, and some key um, themes in the Supreme Court jur jurisprudence over the past decade. Then we're going to jump in and talk about the resentencing resource kit that we at the campaign have created, um, as well as some strategic um, thinking, strategic considerations for your resentencing representation. Um, and then at the end, we're going to conclude with some next steps for engagement. So all right, let's jump in and talk about the national landscape um, in the juvenile life without parole world. So as most of you probably know, in the 1890s, the first juvenile court was created in Illinois based on the understanding that kids and adults are fundamentally different and need to be treated differently in the criminal justice system. And so, you know, in the decade or two following the creation of the first juvenile court, every, every state in the country had created some form of a juvenile court. Again, based on this very common sense understanding that kids and adults need to be treated differently. Now, in the 70s and 80s, we saw the rise of the super predator theory, um, as well as you know, harsher sentencing across the board. And so as a result of those policy changes um, in the last half of the last century, um, kid, more and more kids were transferred to or waived into the adult system and subjected to the same harsh penalties that were being imposed on adults. Uh, but I have good news for you today, which is that we are seeing a reversal of that um, trend towards harsher sentencing policies. We have been able to swing the pendulum back um, in the direction of age-appropriate sentencing alternatives. So as of today, 
there are 21 states that ban life without parole for children in all or most cases. Um, 16 states ban life without parole altogether. And what is truly remarkable, I think, is that the number of states that ban life without parole has tripled, tripled in the four years since the Supreme Court decided Miller versus Alabama in 2012. And if you take a look at the map on the slide, you'll see that the states that ban life without parole represent a really amazing geographic and political diversity. It's not just liberal states or conservative states or coastal states or inland states. It's really, you know, across the country we're seeing momentum towards um, or away from life without parole sentences. Um, just in the past month or two, Utah and South Dakota joined the ranks of states that have banned life without parole. Um, last year, Nevada um, passed a unanimous bill to allow parole eligibility for all youth in the adult system after 15 or 20 years, passed by a Republican House and Senate and governor. Um, and as a, as a result of that, there are folks who are sentenced to life without parole as juveniles um, who have been given the opportunity to go before a parole board. Um, and we've seen at least one example of an individual who is granted parole as a result of that reform effort. And so, you know, I say this as, um, as hope for um, the positive change that we've seen so far and the momentum um, for more positive change that is, is, is on its way. A lot of the legislative successes that we've seen in the past few years um, have been a direct result of or inspired by the Supreme Court jurisprudence over the past decade. So, you know, as you all know, in 2005, the Supreme Court in Roper abolished life, or uh, I'm sorry, abolished capital punishment for, for children under the Eighth Amendment. In 2010, in Graham, the Supreme Court abolished life without parole for non-homicide offenses that for children and said that in those circumstances, children must have a meaningful opportunity for release. In 2012, in Miller versus Alabama, the Supreme Court said that mandatory life without parole for children is unconstitutional. And that before you sentence a kid to life without parole, there needs to be an individualized sentencing determination that takes into account all of who that child is. Um, and after taking all of the youthful factors into consideration, it will be the rare or uncommon child for whom life without parole is an appropriate sentence. Most recently, in January of this year, the Supreme Court decided Montgomery versus Louisiana. In Montgomery, the Supreme Court held that Miller is a substantive decision um, and that the vast majority of youth um, are ineligible for life without parole under the, under the Constitution, under the Eighth Amendment. And, you know, one of the, the central principles of all four of these cases, and I'm sorry, the bracket should, should include Montgomery there, but um, all four of these cases were rooted in adolescent brain development. If you haven't read Roper in a while, I encourage you to go back and reread it. Um, it, it, it really is amazing the fact that the Supreme Court understands the, the medical science, um, the brain science research, that shows that the adolescent brain and adult brain are, are two different things. The last, part of the, the, the last part of the human brain to develop is the part of the brain that controls executive functioning. Um, and so, you know, teenagers, as we all know from life experience, have a heightened sensitivity to peer pressure and their immediate surroundings and a harder time thinking through consequences of actions. Um, and it's, you know, for these developmental reasons, or these developmental reasons served as the foundation for all four of these uh, Supreme Court opinions. And so, you know, many of you engaging in this work know this very well, but I'm highlighting it just to say that because it is so foundational to these four opinions, it should be foundational to how you conceptualize your resentencing representation. Now, I'm just going to go through a few of the key principles uh, um, that I think are that really inform your resentencing um, that we can glean from the four Supreme Court decisions that we just talked about. So the first is, and this is literally a quote from Miller, but it is certainly a, a central tenet of all four of those opinions, that children are constitutionally different from adults for purposes of sentencing. 
So at criminal sentencing, before a kid can be sentenced to life without parole, there are different constitutional protections under the Eighth Amendment for that child. A child cannot be treated in the same way as an adult at sentencing. A second key principle from the court is that the mitigating attributes of youth, all of those adolescent development characteristics we were talking about, have to be considered at sentencing before a child can be sentenced to life in prison. And the court in Miller did a really good job of articulating some of, some of those factors and what those mitigating attributes of youth um, might look like. Now to be clear, this, this is a list that is including but not limited to. This should be a starting point. These are the factors that the court has to consider, but I encourage you as defense lawyers and defense teams to think more broadly, to think beyond this list. So the factors that the court said have to be considered when determining whether a child will be sentenced to life in prison. First, the chronological age, sorry for the tongue tie, um, and its hallmark features. So that includes you know, their immaturity, impetuosity, failure to appreciate risks and consequences. Again, those are direct by byproducts of the adolescent brain development research. Uh, family and home environment, the court has to take into account those factors. So, you know, if your kid lives in a violent community or a family or for whatever reason your, your client may have experienced some form of trauma in youth, all of those factors need to be considered um, by the court at sentencing. Again, the circumstances of the offense, so whether your client um, was influenced by family or peer pressure, I suspect in many of your cases, if you're representing an individual at resentencing, many of your cases involve groups of teenagers acting together. And so that peer pressure component is extremely relevant. Another factor the sentencing court has to consider is you know, the incompetency associated with youth. So did your client have a hard time dealing with police when he, was, he or she was arrested? Have a hard time dealing with prosecutors, negotiating plea deals? You know, it, did your client have a hard time dealing with his own defense attorney at the first, at the original trial? You know, it's a lot to expect a 15, 16, 17 year old um, to have an adult working relationship with, with any of these authority figures. And so the court needs to consider what those relationships were like and how your client's youthfulness uh, may have influenced or undermined those relationships. And lastly, the court says that you have to, cons the sentencing court has to consider the child's capacity for rehabilitation. Now at trial, this would mean we're hypothesizing whether that child can be rehabilitated, can demonstrate positive change over time. At resentencing, we can look back to your client's institutional record and see how your client has in fact changed, has in fact rehabilitated over time. So these are the mitigating attributes of youth that the court articulated in Miller. And again, that is the second sort of key principle we're talking about here that, that we can divine from uh, the Supreme, four Supreme Court decisions. And lastly, I want to highlight the principle that the court in these cases established a strong presumption against life imprisonment for kids. And it's rooted in that, again, going back to the adolescent development research, kids have a unique capacity for positive change. And so the presumption is that kids can and will change. Therefore, life without parole um, must be uncommon in the vast majority of cases. So again, these are foundational principles and frameworks for you to consider um, as you engage in your resentencing representation. And I want to just spend one extra minute on Montgomery since it is the most recent case. Um, and I think, you know, Miller and Montgomery are wonderful decisions but also pose some challenges. So, you know, in, in Roper and Graham, the dividing line between constitutional sentencing and unconstitutional sentencing was 18th birthday, right? It's unconstitutional to sentence a kid to death who's under the age of 18. Um, we all know that that 18 line is a legal fiction. It's not like someone wakes up on their 18th birthday and is miraculously an adult with adult culpability and an adult brain. Obviously, that's not true. But the court sort of delineated in Roper and Graham that youth versus adult, which we as a society have deemed to be 18, is the dividing line. 
Miller and Montgomery did something a little bit different, and Montgomery provides some helpful language to help us understand that. So, you know, Roper and Graham banned a category of punishment, and the court in Montgomery says, Miller, you know, it's true that Miller doesn't bar punishment for all juvenile offenders because it didn't bar life without parole altogether in the way that Gro Roper and Graham banned a category of punishment, but the court says, Miller did bar life without parole for all but the rarest of juvenile offenders. It barred life without parole for all juvenile offenders except those whose crimes reflect permanent incorrigibility. So the only difference, the court says, between Roper and Graham on the one hand and Miller on the other hand is that Miller drew a line between children whose crimes reflect transient immaturity on the one hand and those rare children whose crimes reflect irreparable corruption. So instead of under 18 and over 18, the line is, tr or the balance is transient immaturity on the one hand or irreparable corruption on the other hand. And so I think that framing provides some really significant opportunities for defense attorneys in your representation. Um, I think that there is space and an opportunity to argue that there must be a specific finding of irreparable corruption in order to impose life without parole on a child. Additionally, you know, there's an opportunity for defense attorneys to argue that the state bears the burden of proving that irreparable corruption. It's not for the defense to prove that your client was your client's crime re represented transient immaturity. It's the state's burden to prove that the client's crime reflected irreparable corruption. And obviously that's an incredibly high bar to meet, right? So at trial, proving irreparable corruption, anticipating, divining whether that child is irreparably corrupt or not, is an incredibly difficult calculation. Um, you know, if that if that child engages in some, demonstrates some sociopathy, it's really difficult for an adolescent development expert, a, foren a forensic psychologist, to anticipate whether that sociopathy will continue into adulthood or, or not, right? So that's a high bar to meet. And at resentencing, again, it's a challenge for the prosecution to prove that your client is irreparably corrupt when you can show the positive changes that your client has made in his or her life, demonstrating that the crime reflected transient immaturity and therefore um, cannot be sentenced to life without parole. And interestingly, I think Justice Scalia picked up on how high a threshold this is, how high the burden is to meet for irreparable corruption. In his dissent in Montgomery, which I believe may have been his, his last or second to last dissent, he said that the majority opinion in Montgomery is just a devious way of eliminating life without parole for juvenile offenders. Because he, because he recognized that to prove that a child is irreparably corrupt is a nearly impossible, if not completely impossible, task. Now, I, I'm cognizant that this might not be your reality. This might not be how your judge, your prosecutor, your court interprets this case law. Um, but that shouldn't stop you from raising and preserving these arguments. Um, and I wanna give you one example just to give you some hope here. So in March, um, so this was about a month ago actually, the Georgia Supreme Court in a case called Veal versus State said this. So, you know, Miller said that life without parole has to be uncommon for youth. And so Veal said, Montgomery, the Montgomery majority explains that by uncommon, Miller meant exceptionally rare. And that determining whether a juvenile falls into that exclusive realm turns not on the sentencing court's consideration of his age and the qualities that accompany youth, along with all the other circumstances of the given case, but rather on a specific determination that he is irreparably corrupt. So, you know, I think this is an example of why the, raising these, import, these arguments is so important to you um, in your resentencing representation. And actually, this, uh, Supreme, this Georgia Supreme Court opinion is included in our resentencing kit as document, I believe, number three. Um, so I encourage you to uh, look it up and read it and, and reference it. Um, so that is a great segue then into talking about the resource kit. Um, we developed 
this resource kit because as a national organization working on juvenile life without parole, you know, we have the good fortune of working with defense teams around the country on this issue. And so we see people's creative briefing and motions and sentencing transcripts and we have been able to compile them and wanted to put them in one central place so that attorneys across the country would be able to access them and use them in their own representation. Um, so I'm going to, if you bear with me, just spend a minute or two on how the resentencing resource kit is organized. So it's just a Dropbox. Um, it's a password protected Dropbox. And for now, um, we're limiting access to individuals who are on a defense team actively representing an individual at a resentencing hearing post Miller, post Montgomery. Um, so if you if you don't have access yet, I'll, I have contact information at the end of the webinar so you can reach out to us so that you're able to access it. So the, the key document I think in the in the resource kit is our table of contents. So this is literally just a screenshot of the table of contents. So if you open it up, it'll you know you can scroll through the document to see the different types of information included in the resource kit. And if you click on any of the um, topics in the table of contents, it'll take you to um, it'll take you to that folder farther down in the table of contents. So for example, if you clicked on number five, experts, it'll take you to the experts folder. Again, this is just a screenshot. Um, and in that, you'll be able to see the different documents we've included in each section. Um, each document has a specific number um, because documents are sometimes reflected in multiple different subject areas. For example, you'll see here, document 68 says a sample motion for expert funds. So clearly that's in this expert section, but we've also included it in the sample motion section um, because clearly it's also a sample motion. And so it's document 68 in both places, and so you can just then go to the Dropbox and pull up document 68 um, and use that for your reference. We also have um, subfolders in the Dropbox itself, so you can just click on the expert folders if you want to peruse it that way. But it's organized as, you know, I want it to be as easy for you to navigate as possible. Um, if you ever have any trouble with any of it, please do reach out and let us know because it's it's here for your benefit. So now I'm going to take some time, uh, the majority of the rest of our time together, to walk through some of the resources that we have available in the resource kit and why, why it is that we've included them um, and to get your creative juices flowing a little bit as far as how you're going to engage in your resentencing representation. So I first want to talk about two of the resources in the kit that we at the Campaign for the Fair Sentencing of Youth have developed. Um, the first is a bench card. It's literally just a three-page document um, that's intended as an educational resource for judges. Um, the first page summarizes the relevant law, Roper, Graham, Miller, Montgomery. We created one um, before Montgomery and have since updated it um, post-Montgomery. The second page is a checklist for trial judges um, at sentencing or resentencing. It enumerates factors for them to consider um, at, at these proceedings. And then the last page of the bench card includes adolescent development research that the Supreme Court has cited. Um, you know, so this has been disseminated by the National Center for State Courts um, to all the chief judges, and it's on their website. Um, so it's out there in the world, um, and please do take it and use it, you know, however would be helpful for you. One thing I do want to highlight for the bench card is that, you know, I think in in these resentencing hearings, you know, the court obviously made it abundantly clear that life without parole for kids needs to be uncommon. Um, but I think sometimes judges, as you may have um, witnessed in your own cases, I think sometimes judges look at homicide cases and think clearly this kid is the uncommon kid because most kids don't kill people. So this is the, the kid for whom life without parole is a constitutional sentence. Um, but I think what is important for judges to remember is that Montgomery and Miller are talking about the, popu the population they're considering in these cases is kids who have killed somebody, kids who have committed homicide, right? And so the court is saying that amongst kids who have killed somebody, 
life without parole is unconstitutional for the vast majority of that pool. And so I think the bench card does a good, good job of, of highlighting that um, and flagging it for, for judges who will be um, presiding over resentencing hearings. A second resource I want to highlight that we at the campaign developed um, is the trial defense guidelines. The trial guidelines are a national standard of representation um, for defense attorneys representing juvenile co clients facing life in prison. Um, they have been adopted by over 50 organizations, including NACDL, among many others. Um, and they're really the corollary to the ABA death penalty guidelines. Um, representing a child facing life without parole is an extremely standard, or is an extremely specialized area of defense. Um, and so, you know, the guidelines establish um, what defense teams should look like. They articulate a, a defense team that includes two lawyers, a mitigation specialist, and an investigator. Um, the guidelines articulate different factors of mitigation to investigate and consider presenting to the court. Um, the guidelines were created for attorneys representing kids facing life in prison at trial and not specifically resentencing hearing. And so they're targeted at attorneys whose, whose clients are, are juveniles. So it's undoubtedly different than many of you handling resentencing cases where your client has served 10, 20, 30 years in prison. Um, but many of the same principles apply. And so I encourage you to take a look at them um, as a sort of baseline standard for what representation in these cases should look like. Both documents are, are obviously available in the resentencing, or in the resentencing resource kit, um, and they're also available on our website. The resource kit also includes, um, I think, some really helpful background materials. Um, there is a, a section of the resource kit that deals with adolescent development research. Um, so if that's an area that you're just not as familiar with, um, there, we have some wonderful resources in there for you to get up to speed because as we talked about earlier, it's the adolescent development stuff that really is the foundation to the Supreme Court's um, reasoning in this, in this line of cases. There are also some in the resource kit some helpful training materials for different resentencing trainings that have happened around the country. I realize that's a little bit of a a meta comment given that we're having a resentencing training right now, but um, you know, we've compiled PowerPoints and other resources from trainings that have gone on since Miller um, that are, you know, would be a good place for you to start if this area of practice is new to you. Um, and we also have included a section on secondary sources, so law review articles and the like, um, that are a, a good way for you to get up to date on the scholarly research in this area. In particular, I want to flag one for you that deals with um, why using life expectancy, uh, life expectancy data um, in these cases is unconstitutional. It's specific to post-Graham cases, but I think the arguments there are relevant to post-Miller, post-Montgomery resentencing as well. So I wanted to highlight that one for you. Now, we have um, a large uh, number of motion, sample motions um, and the like. And I wanted to go through some, spend some time going through those with you because I think they raise some really interesting um, and novel legal issues. So, you know, included in the resource kit are sample motions for funding for mitigation specialists, funding for experts, motions to preclude life without parole, motions for jury determination. The list goes on, but these are the sample motions that we will um, talk about over for the next few minutes. So let's start with the motions for funding for mitigators. So, you know, some of you might be asking, why do I need a mitigator in my case? I've been a defense attorney forever. I'm great at investigating. I'm great at interviewing. Um, you know, I would say that mitigation and the mitigation investigation is the, the central piece of your resentencing strategy. Um, mitigation is the heart and soul of your case. Um, this is not about guilt or innocence as much as the prosecutor in your case might want to be uh, litigating the facts of the crime again. It's not about the guilt or innocence of your client. Um, you know, it's about all the factors we've been talking about before, and it's about determining whether your client is irreparably corrupt or not, such that life without parole is an unconstitutional sentence. 
Um, you know, so I think defense teams at resentencing are in sort of an interesting posture because on the one hand, you're arguing that um, it's the state's burden to prove and the court's job to make a specific finding that your client is irreparably corrupt, right? Like the burden is on the state there. Um, on the other hand, the defense teams are saying, I get that it's the state's burden, but if I had to prove that my client my client's crime represented transient immaturity and not irreparable corruption, no problem, I can do that. And to be able to, to, be able to support that assertion that your client's crime reflects transient immaturity, you need the in mitigation investigation to back it up. That's why a mitigator is so crucial to your defense team at resentencing. The mitigator um, has a specialized expertise in conducting social history investigations. So your, um, your mitigator will investigate your client's youthfulness at the time of the offense. All of those Miller factors that we discussed earlier, right? Everything that was going on in your client's life at the time of the offense to provide context for why the offense happened the way that it did. And then again, because we're in the resentencing realm here, you have an institutional record to deal with. So your client has served who knows how many years, could be five years, could be 50 years. Um, and your mitigation specialist can help you dig in and understand and explain how and why your client did what he did during his incarceration. So if your client has done well, your mitigation specialist can you know, compile all of the certificates and achievements and degrees that your client has received um, can interview all of the po the people in your client's life with whom he has positive relationships, can, that your mitigator can interview um, volunteers at the prisons, different correctional officials at the prison, right? All of the work to explain how your client's positive change over time is evidence of the fact that your client is not irreparably corrupt. Um, and if your client has had a harder time in prison, your, mitigation, your mitigator can help with that too. Um, you know, your mitigator can show, help, you know, pull together evidence showing that your client was excluded from programming because he had a life without parole sentence. Um, or that, you know, the lack of hope in his life undermined his ability to, you know, succeed in prison. Maybe he had mental health or trauma related needs that weren't addressed in prison. To help explain why it is, if your client hasn't done well, explain why and how that is evidence of the fact that he would, would not have had such a hard go if he had received a sentence other than life without parole. Um, you know, and your mitigator will also be central to developing a reentry plan because you're asking the court to alter your client's sentence um, such that he or she will have an opportunity to get out. So you need to build a plan around what positive relationships he has in the community, um, what educational or professional opportunities he, he may have, what housing needs um, he'll have, so your mitigator can help work on that as well. And additionally, I just want to say mitigators are incredibly creative in thinking about how to frame your client's life history. Um, Betsy Bybin, who I don't know if she's watching or not, in a resentencing she just did, she works at PDS in DC, um, came up with this great video of her client talking about his life at the time of the offense and his remorse and all of the positive things he's done since then. Um, and it was a great piece of mitigation investigation to present to the court. Um, so, you know, I, obviously I can't understate the importance of mitigation and having a mitigator who's a professional um, to assist you in that endeavor. So mitigators tend to be social workers um, though sometimes it's, you know, folks with other relevant experience. Some mitigators are lawyers, but when I say lawyer, I don't mean like the junior lawyer on your case that you go send out into the field to do interviews. I mean a lawyer who has been trained in um, and has expertise in conducting mitigation investigations. So obviously because mitigators are important, Getting funding to hire a mitigator is important, and so we have some sample motions for funds for mitigators um, in the resource kit. And some of the arguments that these motions make, as you'll see, um, I just want to highlight a few of them. So, you know, you want to argue that you know the court that life without parole is analogous to the death penalty. The court said as much in Graham and Miller, and so you know, having a mitigator is central to capital 
defense. Therefore, having a mitigator must be central to juvenile life without parole representation as well. Um, you know, you can highlight the fact that the court in Miller said that the mitigating attributes of youth have to be considered by the sentencer. And so to be able to present them to the court, you need a mitigator to do the investigation to be able to present them to the court, right? Um, you know, you can just be very clear with the court and say that, you know, lawyers are trained in the law. You know, we lawyers, that, that's our job. We're legal professionals. Mitigators, on the other hand, are trained in social history investigations. And although there's some overlap, we can't expect lawyers um, to conduct the same type of mitigation investigations that mitigators are able to do. Um, and lastly, you know, I encourage you to highlight and cite the ABA death penalty guidelines, which mandate a mitigator as part of a capital defense team, um, and also to cite our trial defense guidelines. So I've seen lawyers in these motions literally just excerpt sections of our defense guidelines, um, arguing that a mitigator as part of a juvenile life resentencing team um, is necessary for constitutionally effective defense. The resentencing resource kit also includes examples of motions for experts, including um, forensic psychologists and the like. And again, hearkening back to the four Supreme Court cases, adolescent development and an understanding of adolescent development is crucial to resentencing hearings. And so, you know, it will benefit, I think, your client to have an expert who is able to speak effectively and educate the court on adolescent, the relevant adolescent brain science generally, um, as well as how it, you know, impacted your client's life um, and actions around the offense. You know, I think some attorneys are concerned about opening up the door to sort of dueling experts with the prosecution, and so obviously that's a strategic determination that you and your defense team and client will have to make. Um, but we have some examples of the different types of forensic psychologist evaluations um, that have been submitted at resentencing hearings, so, so take a look of the, at those. Uh, now I want to spend a couple of minutes talking about the resource kit motions to preclude juvenile life without parole, to preclude life without parole as an option. So, you know, we've seen attorneys get really creative with filing pretrial motions to get life without parole off the table from the get-go. Um, you know, whether it's because your client was convicted under some sort of felony murder accomplice liability theory, you know, arguing that your client was you know, his age, 14, 15, intellectual disability, lots of different creative reasons you can come up with. So let's talk about felony murder as an example. So, you know, again, if we're, if we're operating under the assumption that the state bears the burden of proving that your client is irreparably corrupt, then you can file a pretrial motion if your client was convicted of felony murder, say that the state cannot meet its burden here because you know, and then here are some reasons you can cite. Because a juvenile offender who didn't kill or intend to kill has a twice diminished moral, couple, but moral culpability. That's a quote from Graham. Obviously Graham dealt with non-homicide offenses and didn't wade into the world of felony murder, but the court, you know, the principle still stands. You know, a juvenile is inherently less culp morally culpable than adult, and the court says that, you know, it's, you're twice diminished in your moral culpability if you didn't int intend to kill anybody. Um, you know, you can cite to Justice Breyer's con concurrence in Miller, where he specifically addresses this felony murder issue. And again, you can point to adolescent development, because I would bet the majority of you who have clients who were convicted under some felony murder theory, um, you know, there was some, like, lack of forethought, <laughs> because they were teenagers, right? It's like a group of kids who think we're gonna go rob that house and didn't th think three steps ahead that maybe the homeowner was home and maybe he owned a gun and someone could get shot, right? So those inherent sort of reckless impulsive qualities of youth um, are particularly salient in, in a felony murder accomplice liability analysis. You know, and then sort of fundamentally, I think you're making, you know, you'd be making the argument that felony murder is never going to meet that irreparable corruption standard. Because if we're talking about life without parole being unconstitutional for all but the worst of the worst, 
under almost no fact pattern that I can imagine is felony murder going to fall within that worst of the worst. So, you know, amazingly, we've seen some of these motions succeed in some places, and so we have examples of them um, in the resource kit. So I encourage you to take a look. And again, there, there are, I think, a number of different ways that you can, um, that you can frame this motion to preclude. Be creative. Like, look at the specific facts of your case. You know, if there have been resentencings that have gone forward in your jurisdiction and there have been some favorable outcomes that have resulted in a result, resulted in something other than life without parole, do some sort of comparative analysis. You know, if Joe Schmo got life with parole after 20 years and his facts were worse than my client's, there's no way my client can get life without parole because if that guy wasn't irreparably corrupt, my client certainly isn't. I'm not saying that's a winner of an argument. I'm just encouraging you to be creative in challenging the state to meet its burden um, of proving irreparable corruption. You know, you can also consider a motion for a jury determination. Um, I think that, you know, the court has said juvenile life without parole is analogous to the death penalty. You know, therefore, life without parole has to be treated as an enhanced sentence, um, and a jury needs to determine, make a, you know, affirmative determination of irreparable corruption under Montgomery. Obviously, you can consider whether you think that is an argument you want to make in your case, but again, I think these are important issues to consider raising and preserving, regardless of whether um, you feel confident that you're going to win them. The resource kit also includes um, a number of uh, sentencing memoranda, and I think the sentencing memoranda provides a real opportunity to tie together all of these different themes that we've been talking about so far. Um, it provides you the opportunity to sort of hit the key points, the key principles that the Supreme Court articulated, that kids are constitutionally different from adults for purposes of sentencing, that the transient qualities of youth that the court acknowledged are, are present in your client's crime, right? That, you know, your client's crime reflects all of the stupidity and terrible things that adolescents are capable of doing, but that they're transient and they're not reflective of your client's fixed character over time. Um, you know, the sentencing memoranda gives you an opportunity to talk about your client's maturation as evidence of their transient immaturity. Um, and again, to, to um, hit home the argument that the state cannot meet its burden of proving irre irreparable corruption. Now, all of these obviously are nice theories, but you have to have the mitigation investigation to back them up, which is why, you know, doing the invest the intense uh, workup of your case to be able to ex to have the facts to underline um, all of these uh, principles is so crucial. I also want to highlight victim engagement for you. I think um, it is a mistake for defense teams at resentencing to overlook the victims in your particular case, the surviving victims. The last thing that you want is to not know where the victims in your case stand as far as what they want for your client and to have 20 of them show up at the hearing um, to testify against your client as to all of the harm that your client has caused in their lives, right? Um, we include some resources in the resource kit about um, victim engagement, um, or about defense-initiated victim outreach, I'm sorry, DEVO. DEVO was um, started in the capital defense context, but I think is particularly relevant to um, juvenile resentencing, juvenile life without parole resentencing hearings as well. Um, so, you know, I think different attorneys have been creative about victim engagement in different ways. Obviously, this is an incredibly sensitive area, um, and it's important to recognize that, you know, we talk a lot about the, tr the trauma our clients and this pop ju juvenile life population has endured. Um, it's important to recognize that the surviving victims have also experienced trauma and that for some of them, this resentencing process will be re-traumatizing. That's not to say that the Constitution doesn't demand it and it's not the right thing and we want positive outcomes for all of your, your clients, um, but just to, to keep in mind the impact of 
of these resentencing hearings on the victims as well. Um, you know, so it may be that you engage in some sort of defense-initiated victim outreach. Maybe you can, you know, engage with some of the victim groups in your state. Um, I think it's important to recognize that victims are not a monolithic group. Um, different victims respond to loss differently. Different victims have different interpretations of what is justice and fairness in their particular case. Um, and so, you know, you can't, you can't anticipate necessarily what a particular victim is going to feel. Obviously, having a supportive victim in your, in your case is enormously helpful. Um, if you can anticipate that the victim in your case is going to be unsupportive, it's helpful to know that in advance um, as well. And so, you know, we as an organization work with a number of supportive victim family members whose loved ones were killed by teenagers, um, but who support second chances for all kids. Um, and so at any point, we're happy to talk with you about the, you know, victim engagement in your particular case. Um, I also want to just, you know, highlight some of the other resources that are included in the resentencing um, resource kit. So we do have some amicus briefs that were filed um, actually at resentencing, so not on appeal, um, that I think are really persuasive um, and certainly worth reading. Um, we included some sample orders from cases um, where some of the crazy motions that I just threw out that may seem fairly pie in, in the sky in your particular case um, actually you know, received traction, certainly in the jury determination context. So please do take a look at those as well. Um, we do have some sample transcripts um, of resentencing hearings to get a sense of how these have played out different places. Um, and um, there is um, case law, uh, there's a, so Sarah Russell is a professor at Quinnipiac Law School and she and her students did a tremendous research um, project and compiled relevant case law from all 50 states in this area. Um, and so in the resource kit we have her contact information about how you can reach out to her and get um, and get that information as well. I just want to circle back really quickly to um, the, the jury determination question because we've had some some folks write in with questions about that, about whether we really want juries in these cases. So I think that's an excellent question. Um, I think that there is not an easy answer to that. I think it's probably case specific, jurisdiction specific. Um, you know, I think it would certainly depend on the judge or jury where you are. Um, and I think it is too soon to tell. We don't have sufficient data yet to be able to, to predict um, whether, you know, a, sent, a judge or a jury um, has any better record of favorable outcomes in these cases or not. We're just starting to see jury um, resentencings um, in a handful of places. So thus far, the majority, I think, um, have been, have been bench, bench trials, bench re-hearings. Um, but it's a great question, and I think it's very much a strategic call and something that we're still working through. But I think that there's a very solid argument that your clients have a right to a jury determination. Um, and so it's something at least to, to keep in mind, right? All right, so, you know, that, that's it for, for what I'm gonna discuss in the, in the resource kit itself, because, you know, you all, you know, I welcome you all to spend some time digging through it, um, see what's there and see what's helpful. Um, and now I just wanna talk very briefly to conclude about next steps for engagement. So I want to just stop and s say that you all are at the forefront of this very dynamic and emerging area of the law. So those of you who have cases at resentencing, you are going to shape the law in this area. Um, and so I'm tremendously grateful to you for your commitment to your clients um, and to this issue um, and for being dedicated attorneys. Um, working for fair outcomes for kids who are sentenced to unconstitutional sentences. Um, and you really are the pioneers in this area. So we're cognizant that the resource kit, as it currently stands, um, you know, is one first step, and it represents sort of the beginning development of this area of law. And it will continue to grow and evolve as 
the law and practice continues to change. So this is where I'm going to call on you all as the practitioners um, to help us with that. Um, I'm hopeful that you will contact us with the results in your resentencing cases, um, that you'll contact us with your lessons learned so that we can share them around the country. Um, and if you come across really interesting resources that you think should be added to the resource kit, please do send them to us. Whether it's you know a creative motion that you filed in your case, or an interesting order that you got, or a colleague's, or something you found you know from another state, whatever it is, um, please do reach out because this is dynamic, and we're all in this together. Um, and because we have the good fortune of being sort of the national hub, we're able to take you know, the best of what's happening around the country and disseminate it um, so that you all can, can access and, and learn what's going on elsewhere. Um, and I want to just conclude today by talking about some of the resources that we at the campaign have for you beyond the resource kit, beyond the trial defense guidelines, beyond the bench card. Um, first and foremost, I want to highlight our Incarcerated Children's Advocacy Network. Um, which we call ICANN, and it's comprised of individuals who are sentenced as children either to life in prison and who have subsequently been released um, or sentenced for homicide offenses, other serious offenses, serious offenses who served lengthy periods of time, but who are, doing out, who are out and doing well and are tremendous advocates. Um, you know, our ICANN network is involved in um, our, our, our ICANN network is involved in um, legislative advocacy, public education. They're the living, breathing example of the fact that all kids have the capacity for change, even kids who commit serious crimes. And so I want to highlight this as an advocacy tool, um, or if you think that your state could use an op-ed written by you know, an ICANN member, or if your client gets out, we hope you will connect them with our ICANN network so that they can find a place of support because, you know, it's a really unique experience to go into prison as a kid and come out as an adult and have the world, the world has changed in the interim. Um, and so the ICANN network serves as a really important support network um, among that group and they do just tremendous things. I also wanted to flag for you our national family network. Um, our national family network is for folks whose you know, family members and friends are serving juvenile life without parole. Um, you know, oftentimes they don't have the community support um, that others do because you know, their, their kids or loved ones you know, did serious things, um, but they have functionally lost their kids you know, to prison for the rest of their lives. Um, and so we have monthly calls for the National Family Network members. Um, where you know it's a great place of connection and information sharing and support. So if the family members or friends in any of your cases you think would benefit from the National Family Network, again, please don't um, hesitate to reach out to us. Um, and as I said a few minutes ago, we do have some really wonderful um, victim family members who are incredibly committed to um, changing extreme sentencing of youth in our country, even though they have lost loved ones to teen violence, to youth violence. Um, so in particular, if you have any supportive victim family members in your case, please connect them with us. I think sometimes um, supportive victim family members, again, don't have a great uh, community um, because, you know, victims are often painted as antagonistic to, to um, you know, release of, of the perpetrators in their case. And so, you know, if you do have supportive victim family members, please let us know, and we're happy to connect them. Um, you know, we're also happy to engage with media strategy, conversations around how media is playing out in your case. I mean, I'm sure many of you are trying to stay as low profile as possible, um, but if your case happens to be a pri high profile case and you feel like it's, you know, there hasn't been any favorable press around it, let us know, and we're happy to talk through media strategy in your particular case, or to talk, you know, statewide, sort of a more macro level uh, media strategy approach. And lastly, um, I want to let you know that we are engaged in some, um, in developing parole resources, because, you know, this wave of sentencing reform is certainly the first and incredibly important wave in reform to ensure that kids who are sentenced to die in prison have a chance to get out, right? So we first need to end life without parole sentences for kids. Then the next step is to ensure that kids who are parole eligible have a meaningful shot at getting out and that 
parole eligibility um, means something and isn't just a de facto life sentence. And so we're working to develop parole resources for parole boards to help educate them on the considerations for release of this population because parole boards around the country, as a result of Miller and Montgomery, are going to see more and more um, juvenile offenders, right? For folks who were formerly sentenced to life, juvenile life without parole who are now eligible for release. And so we want to do what we can to equip folks who are serving, the parole board members and attorneys, um, to ensure that, that the sentencing reform piece um, results in meaningful opportunities for release and a second chance um, for the juvenile lifers in our country. So that is the end of my um, formal webinar, but I do have a couple of questions that folks have emailed in. Um, so there's a question about getting a, a forensic psych eval um, and whether the prosecution will um, have a separate independent client evaluation. Um, I think that is somewhat jur um, jurisdiction specific. Um, I think the answer is probably yes, um, but it's possible that in some jurisdiction there will be some sort of um, prison evaluation either way. Um, but if you want to email me after, we can talk about it some more and I can get some more input from um, other colleagues in the field um, and you know think more about the rules in your particular jurisdiction. So I don't know if we have any other questions. All right. Um, well, I just want to say it was um, a pleasure talking with you. I appreciate you listening. Um, and for those of you who don't yet have access to the resource kit, please do contact my colleague Matt Gritzmacher. Um, and then my email is below. I am always happy to talk to you um, and hear for you. Uh, I'm, I'm here for you and um, interested to hear what's going on in your case. So thanks again and um, thanks for your advocacy. I just wanted to say thank you again to Heather Runwick for an excellent presentation and thank you to her in the campaign for the fair sentencing of youth for setting up all these great resources and working with us to get this out to everyone. So as, um, as she said, those of you with cases, we hope you will find this a great resource and contact them for further assistance. As always, thank you for watching our NACDL webcast and please check out our website in the meetings and CLE department and see what else we have coming up as far as live presentations, future webcasts, and other on-demand viewing, including this, which will be available online for your friends and colleagues who are not able to watch today. Thank you.